Hello, this is Kerry Schutz from MathWorks. In this video, I'm going to show a quick and dirty method for characterizing a linear system using a chirp signal as the excitation. So the goal is to somehow measure the magnitude and phase response of our device under test, in this case using only a scope and our function generator. Now typically, if you were trying to measure the frequency response of a system, you would have something like a spectrum analyzer or a network analyzer at your disposal. In this case, we're assuming here that we only have access to a scope, a time domain instrument, and we're gonna see how far we can take that. Now the key is gonna be that we have access to somehow being able to generate a chirp signal, something that sweeps um, over frequency over time in a linear fashion and we're going to sweep this particular uh, signal from 0 to 10 kilohertz. We're going to assume that that's approximately the bandwidth of interest for our device under test and then we're going to look at the response over here on the scope. And as you see over here on the right in our MATLAB workspace we have some some variables defined that our model is going to use. Uh, we've got that BW or bandwidth number 10 kilohertz specified. That's our uh, sweep range. We've got a sample rate specified of 25.6 kilohertz. That's the rate at which uh, the samples, um, uh, that's the rate at which the chirp is sampled. And then we also have the sweep uh, time. So we'll sweep from zero to 10 kilohertz over this one second period. And that one second just makes it very easy uh, to visually calibrate what's going on when we look at the response in our scope. And then we also have defined our device under test out in MATLAB. It's a control systems toolbox TF object or transfer function object. We can look at, at it here if we just type H um, and we can see it's a second order system, both the numerator and denominator. It's a continuous time system. And we have a MATLAB script, uh, which we ran when this model opened and it's it created and specified all these uh, model settings. Again, we see the bandwidth, um, sweep time and all that. And here's our transfer function, a creation line right here. And then I also called, um, or I also have a few lines of code which plot out the frequency response of the system. I plot out its magnitude and phase where I leverage the Bode function from control systems toolbox. So let's run that and get an idea of what the right answer is, or the supposed right answer is, before we jump into trying to characterize this system using measurements instead of theory. So we see it's a notch filter, it's centered, which is the notch frequency centered at one kilohertz. Uh, otherwise, it's a, it's a pass filter at low frequencies, and it's a, essentially a pass filter at higher frequencies beyond a few kilohertz. And then the phase response, we see that it has that characteristic uh, 180 degree phase shift at that notch frequency. And then from DC, it's an increasing phase lag. And then beyond the notch, it's uh, decreasing phase, uh, phase lead. Okay, so it goes from phase lag to phase lead around the uh, resonance point. All right, so that's theoretically the right answer or analytically. Now we want to use these same settings in the model and see if we can um, come up with a measurement scheme that closely uh, mimics the theory. So again, let's run this model, sweep from 0 to 10 kilohertz over one second and see what happens. Let's hit the play button. Let's go over to our scope and immediately see that uh, we see this notch shape right here in the time domain. So again, we are uh, attempting to use this spectrum, uh, this um, oscilloscope as a poor man spectrum analyzer. And it appears at least at a first order, we've done that. If we uh, zoom in on the low frequency portion of the sweep, uh, we see the input in yellow, the output in blue. And as we sweep, we will see gradually, uh, slowly but surely, the response roll off, the blue, uh, amplitude gets smaller and smaller as we approach the notch frequency. And again, as we, and we, we also see if you zoom in, not just the amplitude or uh, amplitude effect or the magnitude response here indicated visually in the time domain, we can also get a sense for the phase response. We can see that um, there is some phase lag from the input in yellow to the output in blue. And so things are making a general sense here. As we approach the notch frequency, we can see the signal almost disappear, and then we ramp back up again in amplitude. But notice as we ramp back up in amplitude that the response now leads the input. So that was that phase reversal I was talking about. Once we pass through a resonance, there is a phase reversal. So in general, at a first cut, it looks like our, our oscilloscope is serving as a poor man spectrum analyzer. 
However, if we dig in a little closer, we're going to see there are some problems. Uh, first off, let's notice what happens at higher and higher frequencies. It looks like there is a small amount of gain um, that we're, we're picking up. In other words, the output is now larger than the input. So if we were to zoom in vertically out here, that'll become a little more evident. We can see that the output, is then, again, is the, at least the envelope of the signal is exceeding the input. Okay, so that's curiosity number one. And then we also want to verify that the notch frequency is actually at the expected um, frequency of one kilohertz. So that's where the one second sweep comes in handy because we know one second corresponds to 10 kilohertz and we have 10 ticks here uh, separated by a tenth of a second that 0 0.1 seconds corresponds to one kilohertz. So if we zoom in horizontally again on that time, We'll get a better feel for it. Let's look at 0 0.1 seconds. And mm, the snag here is it looks like we've already blown past the resonance. The resonance are the, the are the, I'm sorry, they're not the resonance. The notch looks like it occurred around uh, 0 0.95 seconds or 950 hertz instead of one kilohertz at 0 0.1 seconds. So we do have some small discrepancy there. Now, if you're not careful, you could be led to believe that your measurements are correct and the specification you were handed for this filter, namely this, was incorrect. But in this case, the specification is good and our measurements are off. That's that's the problem. Because And the key thing to keep in mind here is that we are not just characterizing um, our device under test necessarily with this uh, blue trace. Uh, we, are, uh, we are characterizing basically everything upstream uh, from the scope, meaning the sampler, the device under test, and the signal generator. And therein lies the problem. So to help clarify what's going on here, let's turn on sample time colors in the model. And we're going to see if we change it to uh, sample rate that, as expected, we've got a 25.6 kilohertz sample rate. We've got a continuous time device under test. And then we resample, go back to discrete time. And there are, of course, repercussions when we move from discrete to continuous and back to discrete again. And the big problem we're facing right now is that we have a discrete time signal, a perfect theoretical discrete time signal, that which has zero rise time, zero fall time, and that has a very, very high bandwidth. Uh, most, it's easy to forget that a discrete time signal does not just have a bandwidth contained within plus and minus FS over two or the sample rate over two. It also has spectral replicas that go up and down the frequency axis forever. So that's a problem here because, well, we're sampling here at some finite rate and uh, any higher, any high, any frequency component higher than tw uh, half of 25.6 kilohertz is going to alias back into our uh, baseband, our, our bandwidth of interest from 0 to 10 kilohertz and then show up as uh, basically corrupting our measurement. So that's a problem. And that's where the anti-alias filter comes in. I had that waiting in the wings for a reason. Uh, let's uncomment that. It is an elliptic low-pass filter of order 8. It's a 10 kilohertz cutoff or band edge, and it has a certain passband ripple and certain stop band attenuation. Let's run again with that and see the effect that has. Well, uh, let's go to the main feature of interest, and that being the notch frequency. And the good news is it does appear that the anti-aliasing filter resolved the issue with the uh, with the uh, frequency uh, nulling at the incorrect time. And so now it's nulling at 0 0.1 seconds corresponding to one kilohertz. So one problem down. What about the uh, higher frequencies where we had some gain before? Well, we certainly don't have gain now. In fact, we've got just the opposite. We've got some amount of small amount of attenuation. Uh, not just attenuation is in flat uh, attenuation, but we've also got some roll off of present uh, as we increase in frequency, if we zoom in a little bit more, we'll see that there is actually some roll off to uh, the amplitude as we go higher and higher in frequency. And there is some undulation or ripple in the response. So what is leading to that? Well, that kind of goes back to our input and our discrete time signal interfacing to a continuous time system again. Uh, first of all, the ripple effect, the undulations are due to the passband ripple in our anti-aliasing filter. So that means at this point, we're characterizing not the device under test, but we're actually characterizing this is part of the anti-aliasing filter. Uh, we didn't really want that in our measurement, but it's there nonetheless, because again, we're measuring everything on this output. Uh, 
Uh, the other issue here, again, you see this roll-off effect. So what is the roll-off about? Well, that is the effect of a implicit zero order hold in the system um, as we sample and hold uh, this discrete time value into our continuous time system in the middle. And so that zero order hold has a, its own characteristic frequency response. It's a sync function or a sine x over x shape, which is essentially low pass in nature with attenuation as you go out higher and higher in frequency. And so that is what's leading to this small amount of roll off we see in the pass band. We could mitigate that or at least or lessen it by sampling the input faster, uh, but it's always going to be there at least to some extent. In this case, we're oversampling by a factor of 2.56. So it's still mm, somewhat evident in our response. So we kind of fixed one problem. We introduced a few other problems. Um, and these, these are the kind of problems that could be mitigated if you wanted to really get fancy about coming up with uh, fancy compensation filters and so on, but that would kind of defeat the quick and dirty scheme we're going for here. Uh, finally, I didn't say much about phase. I, I said a little bit at the beginning that you could get some phase information out of this by just looking at the zero crossing time at particular, at particular times or frequencies, but since frequency corresponds to time here, you could actually compute a phase value because time here essentially corresponds, time and frequency here would map back to a phase value. But that would be not necessarily a trivial measurement because, well, at the low frequencies, it would probably work fairly well. As you get up higher and higher in frequency, you can see that your zero crossing information is not going to be very accurate. You only have a few samples per cycle. So measuring the peaks accurately or measuring the zero crossings accurately uh, is, is problematic if you're just using the raw data. You would need to rely on oversampling or some kind of resampling to do that. So we're not going to do that here. That again, defeats the purpose of quick and dirty. So again, the purpose of this was really just to show you how much you could accomplish using a chirp signal and a scope to do a frequency response characterization. It's easy to get the magnitude. It's quite a bit harder to get the phase response uh, for the reasons I mentioned. Uh, but at least, you know, you could get some information about your system and, and pretty quick without ever having a spectrum analyzer in your hand. All right, that's all I'm going to say about this system for now. In other videos, we're going to cover different types of excitation and different measurement schemes to get, you know, let's say a, a better transfer function measurement. All right, thanks for tuning in.